Distinguished guest participant, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Peace be upon you. So thank you very much for coming on the second day of ISIDA 2020. And after you did your presentation and also your workshop, today we will hold a discussion with two keynote speakers. The first keynote speaker is Professor Peter Swabi from Radboud University in Nijmegen. And the second one is Ms. Elena Sokolova, PhD from Facebook. For your information, we provide two 10 US dollar lucky gift voucher for your active participant in the first keynote session. So please be active and get the reward. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, the first session is keynote speech by Professor Peter Swabe from Redwood University, Nijmegen, Netherlands. The speech will be moderated by Mr. Kurniawan Dwi Irianto, Universitas Islam Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Peter Swabe and Mr. Kurniawan Dwi Irianto. Right, thank you, uh, Ms. Farius. Uh, right, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kurniawan Irianto. I'm your moderator for this session. I believe that some of you are already tired, but please bear with us for a little bit. And now we are in the last two sessions. In this session, we will have the honor of hearing a talk about cryptography. As you may know that cryptography is a part of security topic. We are going to have one main speaker and he will deliver his speech entitled The Transition to Post-Quantum Cryptography. <laughs> challenge and chance. However, before we continue to the talk, please allow me to give you a short introduction of the speaker. Yeah, uh, he is a professor for cryptographic engineering in the digital security group at Radboud University, Nijmegen, the Netherlands. Also, he is a tenured faculty member at the Plank, uh, Max Planck Uni Institute for Security and Privacy in German. He obtained his diploma in computer science from RWTH Aachen University in 2008. And he completed his PhD at the Eindhoven University of Technology, the Netherlands in 2011. His PhD thesis was about cryptography and cryptoanalysis. After graduating from the Eindhoven University of Technology, he went to Taiwan for a postdoc position. He joined several institutes, such as the Institute of Information Science at Academia Sinica, the Department of Electrical Engineering of National Taiwan University, the Research Center for Information Technology Innovation, and the Institute of Information Science of Academia Sinica. His research interest is mainly in post-quantum cryptography. He has many publications as the main author and co-author in reputable journals and conferences. His latest achievement is as the finalist of the post-quantum cryptography standardization project from the National Institute for Standards and Technology, or NISST, in July 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Peter Schwabe of Radboud University, Nijmegen. Peter Schwabe, are you there? I'm there. Thank you very much for this okay. introduction. Let me uh, yeah, start yeah. by sharing my slide here, my screen. Okay. okay. Right. So, um, uh, before I continue, let me uh, give information uh, first. So, um, uh, welcome to the conference. Herzlich uh, willkommen an the conference. And thank you for joining us. Uh, now, uh, we will have 50 minutes for the talk and 20 minutes for the question and answer. Is it okay for you or you need more time for the talk? Roughly, I'll see how I, how I end up. It might be a little more, um, but I, let, let's see, yeah. Okay, cool. 
Um, for the audience, if you have any question during the question and answer session, you can use raise hand feature in the Zoom chat and we will allow you to speak and you can say your question directly to the speaker. And then if, uh, if you, uh, otherwise you can write uh, your question in the room, uh, Zoom chat and we will read your questions. Right, uh, are you ready for the presentation, Professor Schreiber? Of course. Cool. So, uh, Professor Schreiber, you may start your talk, please. All right, well, thank you very much for the very kind introduction and uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, yeah, thank you. So thank you very much for uh, more than 200 people to actually join in this, in this virtual setting. Now, I yeah, assume yeah. we would all wish uh, this talk to be um, in person and that we could all be in Indonesia. I certainly would wish that I was in Indonesia right now. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I decided that uh, I would, no, actually, why does my, ah, okay. That I would start my talk with an example that is at least travel related. So mm. what you see here in, uh, on, this, on this slide is the, the login page of, of Airbnb. And mm. well, I would assume that most of you or many of you have used Airbnb uh, before. And well, when we log into this website, what we're entering is we're entering our email, we're entering our password, and then we're transmitting this to Airbnb. And now we have some sort of security requirements when we do this. Uh, first of all, we don't want a passive attacker listening on the internet to be able to just read our password and, for example, cancel a booking just before we arrive or something like this. Um, this is maybe the sort of more obvious one. The slightly less obvious one is that in the first place, we need to make sure that when we type www.airbnb.com, that we actually end up on the Airbnb website and not some lookalike website that is controlled by an attacker. Now, of course, this is all guaranteed because we see here on the top, um, we have this small lock item, which basically tells us this is secure. This is a secure connection and we've been all educated that, well, as long as we see this small lock item, everything's fine. Let's look a little bit under the hood and into what is really happening there. And we can do this by uh, looking into the security properties of this connection. And this tells us all kinds of stuff about, well, what is happening in the background. Specifically, it tells us that this connection is secured with a protocol that is called TLS 1.2. Now, it also gives us some more information about which combination of cryptographic algorithms is being involved into that. And I would like to focus on only this little bit at the beginning here, where it says ECDHE RSA. Now, what does that mean? ECDHE stands for elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman ephemeral. And that is basically used to establish a shared secret between your browser and the server at the beginning of the connection. And then that shared secret is afterwards being used to encrypt all of the communication, encrypt your password, and make sure that um, information isn't being modified in transit. The second part is this RSA. And that is the RSA signature algorithm in this case, which ensures that while well, we're actually really talking to airbnb.com and not to some attacker's uh, lookalike website. The underlying problems behind these two algorithms are in the case of RSA, the hardness of factoring big integers. So you can show that if you take a product of two very large primes, and an attacker can factor this, they can break RSA. ECDHE is based on a somewhat related problem, which is called the discrete logarithm problem. I won't want to go into too much detail here, but I didn't have to search for a very long time to find a website that actually uses this combination of cryptography based on factoring and cryptography based on discrete logarithms. In fact, you can pick pretty much any secured website on the internet and you will find exactly this combination. And in a way that's good because if we are trusting only on a rather small set of algorithms, then while those algorithms can be well studied, we can understand the security really well. We know which parameters we need to choose to make this whole thing secure. 
implementers know that they need to write only small pieces of software to make them efficient and secure, and we're all good. However, this sort of monoculture is, becomes a problem if the underlying problems turn out to be not as hard as we thought, because then suddenly the whole security of the internet breaks down. Funnily, this already happened in the 90s. In the 90s, um, Peter Shore published a paper that already in the title promises that exactly the two problems that we believe are hard are not hard at all. Namely, the title says that there are polynomial time algorithms, efficient algorithms for prime factorization and discrete logarithms. Now what saves us today and the reason that we are still using cryptography based on these two problems is the last little bit of the title, which says on a quantum computer. So basically what this paper did is it said, well, if physicists and quantum engineers are able to build a large universal quantum computer, then those two problems are no longer hard and all of today's crypto is broken. Now, as long as physicists and quantum engineers don't manage to do this, this is not much of a problem for our internet security. And for a long time, it was believed that this is actually not going to happen or it's not going to happen anytime soon. This has changed over the last decade or so. Here's a quote by Mark Ketchen that I really like to illustrate that. It's a quote from 2012. And Mark Ketchen said about quantum computers that in the past, people have said, maybe it's 50 years away. It's a dream. Maybe it'll happen sometime. I used to think it was 50. Now I'm thinking like it's 15 or a little more. It's within reach, it's within a lifetime, it's going to happen. So if we believe him, then let's say, even if it's a little more, then within something like 10, 15, maybe 20 years from now, all of the cryptography that we're using today will be broken. Well, all of the asymmetric cryptography, the key agreement and the signatures that, for example, are being used in TLS. This is where so-called post-quantum crypto comes in. Post-quantum cryptography is cryptography, mainly asymmetric cryptography, so key exchange public key encryption signatures that resists attacks by classical computers and also by large universal quantum computers. There is five main directions um, of constructing such post-quantum crypto. Clearly, we can't base it on factoring anymore, and we can't base it on discrete logarithms anymore. So we need sort of different underlying mathematical problems to, to build this new generation of cryptography. One direction is so-called lattice-based cryptography that, well, is based on certain hard problems in lattices, in high-dimensional lattices. And these can be used to construct both key agreement or public key encryption and signatures. Then there is code-based crypto, which is based on error correcting codes. And so far it looks like it's mainly useful to construct public key encryption. There exist some signature schemes, but they're not very efficient. Then there is multivariate based crypto, which is based on the hardness of solving um, large nonlinear systems of equations in many variables, typically quadratic equations. Those are mainly useful to build, to build signatures. You can build encryption schemes, but again, they're not very efficient. Then there are hash-based signatures. And really, hash-based signatures only give you signatures. There's no way in this realm to construct key agreement or public key encryption. And then finally, there is isogeny-based crypto, which so far is mainly giving you public key encryption or key agreement. Now, the need for well, research into public key cryptography for quite a while was only recognized by academics. So, well, basically, it was a fun playground to think about next generation of cryptography. But as long as people believe that a quantum computer wouldn't be built within the next 50 years, there was not really much of a, of a need to push for this to go into the real world. Well, as I said, over the last decade, this perception changed and also standardization bodies realized that it might make sense to, well, look into post-quantum crypto 
and actually standardize some schemes so that we can migrate all of our current digital infrastructure to this new generation of crypto. Most notably, the National Institute for Standards and Technology in the US, NIST, decided to run a project that aims at eventually standardizing some post-quantum crypto schemes. The way that they set this up is inspired by two so-called crypto competitions. One ended up by standardizing the advanced encryption standard, AES. That one was running from the late 90s, from 97 to 2000. And AES is by now probably the most widely used crypto algorithm in the world. The second one was about a new so-called cryptographic hash algorithm, SHA-3. And that competition ran from 2007 to 2012. The general idea of these crypto competitions is that NIST issues a call and specifies some criteria, basically says what they would like to have, and then everybody is welcome to submit proposals. It's of course mostly researchers from academia and industry who have been working in the field before, who already had some ideas and then, well, basically work them out nicely and make them fit with the criteria that NIST wants and then submit. But in principle, any, anyone who's interested can submit a proposal. Then what NIST does is they select this through an open process, really involving the scientific community, um, requesting feedback to the candidates, and they do that through multiple rounds. And in each round, they essentially narrow down the field of competitors until, well, in the previous two competitions, there was one winner left in the end that got standardized by NIST. The actual decisions of which schemes advance to the next round are being made by NIST, but they're listening very closely to what the community says, for example, in terms of attacks, in terms of performance and, and such. For the post-quantum crypto project, which NIST well stated as it's not a competition for some reason. Um, I think mainly because they don't expect there to be just one winner. It's still pretty much a competition and everybody calls it the NIST post-quantum competition or the NIST post-quantum not a competition. So the way that they set this up is that in February, 2016, NIST stated that they would want to issue um, a call for proposals and uh, drafted something and then requested feedback by the community already for the call. So if everything that they're actually requesting makes sense to the public, to researchers, then they issued the call for proposals in December, 2016. And that call was based on the input they got from the community. They didn't take into account every feedback they got, but, uh, or it was at least not reflected in the final call, but you could clearly see that the feedback mattered. And they set a deadline for submissions about a year later in November 2017. Now, in November 2017, uh, well, they received multiple submissions, of course. And a few days after that submission deadline, Jacob Alper and Sheriff from NIST tweeted this overview that they were working with internally. And I really like this overview because there are so many things that you can see in this numbers. First of all, you can see there was a grand total of 80 submissions at the time. Later, it turned out that some of them didn't fulfill the formal requirements, so that was narrowed down to 69 only. You can see the categories that I mentioned earlier. So for example, you see that there is a lot of code-based key exchange and a lot of lattice-based key exchange. You also see that there are lattice-based signatures. What I found interesting is that there was quite a few code-based signature proposals, which I hadn't expected. You do see hash-based signatures, which, well, as you can see, there's only signatures. There's no key exchange or, uh, public, uh, or public key encryption. You also see um, the multivariate quadratics. Again, I was really surprised. So you see the, the signatures that I had expected. But what was really interesting to see is that there's also six public key encryption or key agreement schemes that, that went into here. And then... Well, you see the isogeny scheme, you see exactly one proposal. That was one key, uh, key agreement proposal. And then you see a few that totally don't fit into this, uh, into the realms that are sketched earlier. So you might wonder like, what's up with those? Well, let me give you one example of what's up with those. And that's this random walk proposal down here. So this random walk proposal 
was broken, I think, four hours after the proposal was posted online, and it was completely broken by a PhD student from Eindhoven called Lorenz Pani. I found this extremely impressive, because if you think, I mean, four hours generally is extremely fast. But on one day, NIST published 69 proposals. Each of those proposals had specifications of sometimes up to 100 pages. Some were considerably shorter, but still, I mean, even looking through those and figuring out which one to attack takes quite a while. So I asked Lorenz, and I asked, so Lorenz, how did you do this? He said, well, I first looked at only the proposals that had their specification not written in LaTeX, but in Word. And then among those ones, I looked at the ones that clearly had the most wrong security claims. And this one claimed something that provably isn't possible. So then he broke it. And he said he didn't even need to understand in detail what the idea was behind it. It was just rather clearly easily broken. There's another weird thing in this table, and that's this RSA here on the bottom. Basically, just a few slides ago, I told you that, well, RSA will be broken by large quantum computers. So what does it have to do in a post-quantum project? Well, it turns out that if you make RSA just really, really inefficient enough, it might be secure also against quantum computers, if you're willing to take a week for encryption, for example. So um, Dan Bernstein submitted a post-quantum RSA proposal, which I think was a little bit of a way for him to troll NIST and have them run their benchmark tools for an insane amount of time. Okay, so this was the initial uh, scenario. And then um, over a bit more than a year, those, uh, those proposals got evaluated. And NIST said that in January, 2019, at the conference Real World Crypto, which is one of the biggest conferences in cryptography, they would announce which of the schemes make it to round two. It didn't quite happen. Um, there was a US government lockdown and uh, the NIST officials were actually not allowed to attend the conference or say anything there. So the announcement was slightly later and they narrowed the field down quite considerably. So from the 69 complete and proper submissions they had, they narrowed it down to um, 17 key agreement or encryption schemes, nine letters-based, seven code-based, one isogeny-based, and to a total of nine signature schemes, three letters-based, two hash-based. You need to be a bit careful here. It's actually, one of them is not strictly speaking hash-based, so let's say symmetric crypto-based, and four multivariate quadratic schemes. So now we're exactly in that realm that I sketched at the beginning, where you can see lattices is good for both, uh, code-based mainly for encryption, isogeny-based only for encryption, hash-based only for signatures, and so on. Again, about one and a half years later, NIST said that in June 2020, they would announce the round three candidates, so the finalists of this competition. Now, I can only guess that it's probably because of a global pandemic that, again, they were well somewhat later with this announcement. So it was in July when they announced the round three uh, candidates. And then something quite interesting. They did not just say, here's the finalists. Well, they did say, here's the finalists. And the finalists were four key agreement schemes where three are lattice-based and one is code-based. And they said they would standardize only one out of the three lattice-based ones. And then three signature schemes, the two lattice-based ones and one multivariate quadratic one. Again, they said that they would standardize only one of the two lattice-based ones. On top of that, they also advanced a certain list of alternate schemes where they said, well, this is not the schemes that we anticipate we will be standardizing, well, at the end of this competition right away. But we do see ways for them to be standardized eventually, either later or as a replacement for the finalists should new attacks surface and, and actually show that, that the finalists would be a really bad idea. And among those, there's uh, about five key agreement schemes, two lattice-based, two code-based, one isogeny-based, and then three signature schemes, two symmetric crypto-based ones and the MQ-based one. Also, when they made a decision between alternate and finalists, mm -hmm. they decided that they would advance finalists for schemes that are most likely to be immediately usable in the systems we're using today. So 
What now? Well, NIST is expected to announce the winners in late 2021. They didn't actually say late 2021, but they said that the third round should take a year up to one and a half years, which puts us into late 2021. And then maybe it takes them a while longer to actually write the standards, like based on the proposals. So let's say maybe one year later, we get the standards. We just uh, replace all the existing crypto today with all the new shiny schemes, freshly standardized by NIST. And the mission is accomplished. The world is safe again. Or is it? Well, it's tricky. And in order to understand why I believe that actually this migration even once the schemes are standardized, it's not going to be that easy. Let's look back a little bit into a case where we needed to replace some crypto. And that's the story of MD5. MD5 is a cryptographic hash function. And cryptographic hash functions, even if you don't know much about it, they're used as building blocks all over the place. Any protocol that you're using, anything that you're using to secure communication, probably at some point somewhere uses a hash function. So MD5 was proposed in 1991 by Rivest and uh, very quickly became one of the most widely used hash functions. Already in 1993, um, two researchers, uh, Dan Wu and Bosselars, they presented a collision inside the compression function. It's pretty technical. It doesn't didn't mean there's an attack against MD5. It's just this kind of thing where you feel like it's a bit fishy. It's not the kind of thing you would like to see in a cryptographic design. 1996, there was a paper by Dobertine, Bosselars, and Prenel, three experts on hash functions, and they expressed concerns about using MD5. Now, at this point, if there's experts expressing concerns, saying, you know, this is maybe not what you might want to use, you might want to think about using something else. However, the world continued, everybody continued using MD5 until 2004, where Wang presented MD5 collisions. Crypto 101, first introductory lecture, you learn something about hash functions that they need to have three properties. One of them is that it must not be possible to find collisions. So at this point, MD5 is dead. And people kept using it with the reasoning that, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, of course it's not good but collisions are not really a problem. You can't really attack our system with this. So we'll just keep using MD5. Until 2008, when Sotirov, Stevens, Applebaum, Lenstra, Molnar, Osseg, and De Wecher presented an attack using MD5 vulnerabilities that gave them a rogue CA certificate. Now that basically allows you to impersonate any website on the internet and your browser will just accept any attacker's website as the legitimate website that the user is expecting to see. So complete break of internet security with this. At this point, the world realized, okay, we should really, really stop using MD5. There's rumors that Microsoft hired a person whose only job it was to remove MD5 from all of the Microsoft products. Not sure if that's true. If it's true, that person failed because in 2012, there was the flame malware, which was distributed through Windows updates, which, well, used exactly an MD5 weakness in, um, in this Windows updater. Now, this is what it looks like when crypto needs to be replaced. And let me tell you, replacing MD5 was easy. There was actually, academically speaking, there was a drop in replacement where you could have used SHA-1, you could have used SHA-2. There's just something where you just take out MD5, you plug in something new, everything is fine. That's what needs to happen. Replacing post-quantum crypto, well, replacing the current cryptography with post-quantum crypto is harder on multiple levels. And let me give you multiple reasons why this is the case. The first one is performance. So in cryptography, we're in an area where performance matters, and it doesn't only matter asymptotically or as in complexity classes, but we do care about 10% performance difference. Partially this is because we have these farms of internet servers that are doing a lot of, lot of cryptographic operations and 10% faster crypto means 10% less energy bill, which actually makes a difference. Also cryptography on the other end of the scale is running on really tiny devices, smaller than a coin, and it needs to fit. So 10% in size RAM ROM requirements may mean it fits or it doesn't fit. So 
we have very small routines that are executed many, many times, and these routines are hand optimized on assembly level. And we do care about 10% difference. Now, with this in mind, let's look at performance difference when migrating from the current state of the art to post quantum crypto. Current state of the art is so called elliptic curve cryptography. As I said earlier, it will be broken by Shor's algorithm on large quantum computers. But for the moment, we have cryptography that Basically, all operations cost about 100,000 cycles on an Intel CPU. Ballpark number, very rough. Just keep that in mind. So signing, verification, key generation, all of those things, roughly 100,000 cycles. And everything we're sending over the channel, so keys, signatures, any cryptographic object we're sending, is between 32 and 64 bytes. So it's really tiny. Even for embedded devices, that fits comfortably. Here's a few numbers from post-quantum crypto. Mechalese, the one remaining, well, the one finalist that is code-based key encapsulation, half a megabyte. So comfortably four orders of magnitude bigger than what we're currently using. Sphinx plus signatures, many different traders possible for some medium-sized parameter set. We end up with 16 kilobyte signatures. That's still around three orders of magnitude bigger than what we have today. The same one, same parameter set, signing costs 3 billion cycles. And I'll leave it to you to figure out how many orders of magnitude more that is. In an area where, remember, we care about 10% difference. It's not all that bad. So for example, I showed you that there's three lattice-based CAMs still in the competition. And Kyber, one of the three, takes less than 80 kilocycles, 80,000 cycles for all of the operations. So this is actually even a bit faster than what elliptic curve cryptography takes. However, what we need to send over the channel is bigger also here. It's not terribly big, but it's still more than a kilobyte in each way. Second challenge, well, maybe I should have made this the first one, but it's security. The way that we build secure schemes is that we work with so-called security reductions. So we show that if an attacker can break the security properties of a certain crypto scheme, this can be used as an oracle to solve some hard mathematical problem. That's a great idea because then crypto analysts don't have to study every single scheme individually, but they can focus on the hard underlying mathematical problem, study that one. And then we have this reduction from the hardness of that problem to the security of the system. There's a few caveats though. One is that these reductions are often not tight. So what you would like to have is that, well, you get one query to this oracle that breaks the system, and you use that one query to solve the mathematical hard problem with extremely high probability, ideally probability one. But often it's the case that you need to query this oracle many, many more times, say two to the 40, two to the 50 times. Or you get extremely low probability to actually solving the mathematical problem. You can account for this loss, for this difference between the two hardness properties in the choice of parameters, but that's typically not what is really happening. So the proofs say something about the abstract scheme asymptotically, but they often don't say much about the concrete parameters we're using. Second problem is, well, we need to actually understand these underlying mathematical problems. We need to understand how hard they are exactly to choose parameters accordingly. And while some of them, they're studied for many, many years already, and we have reasonable trust um, in the hardness of these problems. Some others, we would expect serious progress still in, well, actually solving the mathematical problem. And the third problem is that while these proofs may simply be wrong, and this is slightly embarrassing for our community, but there have been many, many examples in the past where these security reductions turned out to be not correct. Now, if this is in some obscure paper in a very small conference, 30 page proof somewhere in the appendix where reviewers maybe didn't check carefully and the scheme is never being used, you could say it's still an academic problem, but maybe not a problem for real world security. It becomes a problem for real world security if a proof is wrong and the scheme actually does get used and the scheme turns out to be actually insecure. Here's one recent example of that, OCB2. 
proposed by Rogaway in 2004. Now, Rogaway, one of the experts in our community, he definitely knows how to write proofs and major accomplishments for our community. But he's human and humans make errors. So he made an error in that proof. 2009, it got standardized and used in some systems. And then only in 2018, specifically on the 26th of October, Inoue and Minamatsu showed that they can break the authenticity that was guaranteed by the proof. And only about two weeks later, two papers independently showed that they can also break the other property, which is the confidentiality. So by that time, OCB2 was completely broken. How about this property in the context of post-quantum crypto? Well, in the NIST competition, we did already see some proof failures. So schemes that were submitted where proofs were actually wrong. One example was that the round one Kyber proof, well, you could say the proof wasn't wrong. It just didn't apply to the scheme that was being proposed. So that was a problem, but it didn't lead to an attack. Similarly, the Sphinx Plus proof also didn't apply to the scheme. Again, it was not leading to an attack, but while it was a concern that the proof was wrong. Somewhat of an opposite situation was the case with MQGSS, where while the proof was completely correct and applied to the scheme, but it was not tight. And there was an attack which actually was sort of hiding inside this non-tightness where, while asymptotically everything is fine, but for the concrete parameters, you didn't get the security that you wanted. Now, when I mentioned these three schemes, I mentioned those because I don't like too much to point with fingers at other people. So those are all three schemes that I'm involved in. And actually I can say that, yeah, we screwed up. We're not the only ones screwing up. And let me just say there was a, a very interesting example of Q Tesla, where it's a signature scheme. And uh, Vadim Lubashevsky and me, we presented an attack against some parameters, which, well, we say devastating. It was a forgery attack where computing forgeries was faster than the legitimate signing routine proposed by the, by the Q Tesla submitters. Clearly, something must be wrong in the proof. We didn't check the details of the proof. We could just say, well, it's very obviously not secure. Security goes further. So we also care about implementation security. And what you see in this picture is somebody picking the lock of a safe. And he's not doing this by trying all, all combinations, but he's doing this by listening to the sound that the lock makes when turning the wheel. And we can do something very similar with cryptographic devices. So for example, we can measure the power consumption of a device, or we can measure the electromagnetic radiation of a device. In some cases, we can just simply measure how long it takes for a device to perform a certain computation. And that leads to so-called side channel attacks where, well, we measure this information, and if this information depends on secret data, we can use the information to, well, compute back to the secret data. What is really scary, so power consumption and electromagnetic radiation, you need to be in physical proximity. You need to actually get there with a probe. But timing attacks, you can do remotely. We have some idea how to protect against these kind of attacks. Um, it's a very active area of research and the cost of the countermeasures heavily depends on the scheme. Now for post-quantum cryptography, because it's a younger area, at least when it comes to real practical, real world implementations. <coughs> I really like this quote from 2017, where Primas, Fessler and Mangard said that the implementation security aspect of lattice-based cryptography is still a vastly unexplored and open topic. And let me just add that this is actually also the case for pretty much all other areas of post-quantum crypto. The baseline that we would like to have for all schemes is that we have so-called constant time implementations. That means that we have an implementation where the execution time does not depend on secret data. So that systematically protects us against the timing attacks that can be carried out remotely. At the moment, it's even unclear if all round three schemes have constant time implementations. I think all of them claim that, but it's not entirely clear if it's true. There's very few implementations that also have countermeasures against power analysis or electromagnetic radiation analysis and becomes even worse if we also consider fault attacks, where attackers, for example, shoot devices with lasers to trick them into doing wrong computations that might reveal something about the sequence. So at the moment, for many applications, I would say that 
the implementations that we have of the post-quantum schemes. They're simply not ready yet. So another challenge, and that is the huge foot cannons. Uh, it's a bit of a funny slide title maybe, but we already have some sort of standard for post-quantum cryptography. There is hash-based signatures, XMSS and LMS. They have pretty reasonable performance. They have reasonable signature sizes. They have small keys. There's many application-specific trade-offs where you can really make sure that for your specific application, the scheme behaves nicely. Very conservative security, well understood. There is a NIST fast track for standardizing those two schemes. There's one caveat though, they're stateful. So usually in a cryptographic signature scheme, digital signature scheme, when you're signing, you always use the same secret key for signing a message. What you need to do in these schemes is that after each time you sign, you need to update your secret key. Now, updates are not hard. They're as easy as just updating a counter. So if, as long as you can count one, two, three, everything is fine. The only thing you need to guarantee is that you never go back to an earlier state. That sounds easy, but now imagine combining this with, for example, backups, where you have a backup of your key, you use the key in the live system for a while to sign, then the system crashes and you restore your backed up key. Then you go back to an earlier state and all security is lost. Another example would be virtual machines where you're cloning virtual machines that have the same kind of state and same, same kind of data. And then you sign in both and then you reuse the same state. And again, security is completely gone. And this kind of behavior that you need to be able to securely maintain state uh, was called a huge foot cannon by Adam Langley a while back in a blog post. The final challenge that I would like to show you is what I like to call the curious case of Diffie-Hellman. Everyone here who has followed a crypto, uh, a crypto lecture, like introductory lecture to cryptography, has at some point seen Diffie-Hellman key exchange, where you have Alice and Bob, they want to agree on a shared key over an insecure channel. And what Alice does is she's choosing a random value A, she's computing G to the A in some group, abelian group, finite abelian group. Bob chooses a random value B and computes G to the B. And Alice sends this G to the A over to Bob. Bob sends the G to the B back to Alice. And then they can compute the same key, which is G to the AB. The attacker only sees G to the A and G to the B. And as long as the attacker can't really get the, one of the exponents, the attacker can't compute the joint key. Now, let me show you one thing in this slide that everybody who has seen Diffie-Hellman knew this but never wrote it down. Namely, you can swap the two errors. Bob can send first. It's not a very dramatic uh, achievement. I mean, they're basically sending the same thing, so it doesn't matter who sends first. But what that means is that each party can compute what they need to send without having received anything from the other party. And that makes this key exchange non-interactive. Each one can compute their message without interaction with the other party. Now, the closest thing that we have in a post-quantum world to this is key encapsulation. And you can already see that it looks somewhat different. So what happens here is that Alice computes, well, uh, some public value, public key, sends it over to Bob. And in a Diffie-Hellman setting, that would be sort of this G to the A. But then Bob performs a computation which requires this public key as an input. So Bob can't send first, because the thing that Bob computes is a different object. It's a ciphertext that Bob sends. Now, in the end, both of them still have a key, but this protocol is inherently interactive. I should say, when I'm saying that this is as close as you get, this is not entirely true. There is one proposal for a direct replacement for Diffie-Hellman, which was proposed in 2018 by Kastrick, Lange, Martindale, Rennes, and Pani. It's called Seaside. It's not in the NIST competition, simply because it was proposed too late. Also, it's not exactly efficient. And the concrete security or the security for concrete parameters is at the moment under a very heavy debate. So it's not something that I would necessarily recommend people to use at the moment. Now, Diffie-Hellman key exchange is used in many, many systems all over the place. In many systems, it's not a problem to turn it into an interactive setting where it's clear which party needs to send first. But in some settings, we can't we actually need the non-interactive feature. 
So we, we don't have a reliable post-quantum drop-in replacement. Having said all of this, I hope that I convinced you that this is all a big challenge. So you might wanna ask how much time do we have to tackle this challenge? Um, in the slide title, I phrased it a bit more dramatically. I said, is it actually maybe already too late to tackle this? Well, let's assume that today's crypto is broken by quantum computers in 15 years. When do we need to start migrating? Consider the following attack. Consider an attack where the attacker is recording messages today and well, goes back to those in 15 years with a large universal quantum computer and decrypts all of those messages. The picture you see here is the Utah data center of the NSA in Bluffdale, where we believe the NSA is doing exactly the first part of the attack, namely recording large amounts of encrypted communication. So really when you have this attack in mind, then the question becomes, well, how long do we need today's communication to be secure? For the example at the beginning for the Airbnb login, probably I don't care if the NSA can read it in 15 years, but there might be other applications where, well, depending on where you live and what you're doing, maybe as a profession, you may, you may care if people can read this in 15 years. And then of course, there's a second question, which is how long does it take us to migrate? How long does it take us to tackle all of the challenges that I showed before? You may say, all right, this attack applies to encryption, right? Where you break confidentiality in 15 years. But then for signatures, at least, we should have more time. So I've had this discussion many times where people say, well, you know, encryption, we understand, we need to maybe deal with really soon. But with signatures, we can just keep using the pre-quantum current signature schemes and then only stop accepting those signatures once there is a big, big quantum computer. In a way, that's correct. But you may need to be sure that once that happens, you can migrate your devices. For a Windows update, it's not a big problem. In 10 years, Microsoft might just send you a Windows update saying, from now on, all of our code signatures are post-quantum signatures. And then everything is good. In the future, all of the updates are signed with some post-quantum scheme. All good. But think about tiny embedded devices where the post-quantum signatures might simply not fit. So they can't just in 10 years push an update saying, oh, from now on, just accept post-quantum signatures if you can't even help hold them in RAM. Now think about it. What's the lifetime of a car? A car is just a driving network of computers nowadays. Or what is the lifetime of smart home appliances? So what I'm saying is we don't need to put post-quantum signatures into those today, but we better make sure that we can when we have to. Now, in my title of my talk, I said that post-quantum crypto and the migration is at the same time a challenge and a chance. And so far, I've only talked about how this is a challenge. You may wonder, so this is, seems pretty tough. How can this be a chance? Well, if we look at crypto today, it's not exactly a perfect world. So we do occasionally see headlines of attacks against cryptographic systems. This is already almost a decade old where the PlayStation 3 got completely hacked mm -hmm. because crypto wasn't being used in the right way. Another example is from just a few years ago where Infineon products, in particular Infineon smart cards, had a bug which meant that a lot of their keys were generated in an insecure way. Another example where, well, a new wireless hack can unlock 100 million Volkswagens. Or the Minerva attack from last year, which can recover private keys from cryptographic libraries. And then finally, it's also uh, just in this year that Microsoft had to patch a serious crypto flaw. So I wouldn't say that cryptographic implementations are bad. They're certainly the code quality of most of them is better than say average code. But also cryptographic implementations are inherently in your trusted code base. They're inherently security critical. So whenever something goes wrong, it typically means that a lot goes wrong. And it's not like this situation isn't improving. I think that with research into better cryptographic implementations, we have made serious progress over the last few years. But deploying those changes is not always easy. 
the few users who are, when they see, okay, this is clearly better, they will just migrate. And then there's other users who are very uh, slow in adapting to, uh, to better, well, adopting better solutions. Financial sector is one example. They're still using very old crypto uh, just, well, because it isn't really broken yet, although there's much, much better solutions. So what I would be hoping is that when the whole world needs to migrate to a new generation of cryptography, they also migrate to a new generation of implementations of cryptography. And that is a chance to, well, basically get better crypto, better crypto implementations deployed. And that's specifically one area of research that I hope will contribute to this. And that is the area of so-called high assurance crypto. And what that means is essentially the marriage of techniques from formal methods and from crypto software development. And the idea is that you take formal specifications of your cryptographic primitives, you take formal specifications of the security properties that you would like to have, and formal specification of the implementation security that you would have. So for example, what information leaks to an attacker or must not leak to an attacker. And when I say formal here, we, at least for the first two, we usually do have that already. That's great, but I mean that it's actually more than just formal, it should be machine readable. Because if it's machine readable, what we can do is we can annotate all of our implementations with, um, well, help for a computer system to verify that the software is correct, that it actually correctly implements the specification, that it matches the security notion that we want by computer verifying the security reduction and thus eliminating this problem of wrong proofs or wrong security reductions, and also computer verify the implementation security. Should be a bit careful here when I say high assurance, this doesn't mean that this is unbreakable because it all, met, uh, it, it all depends on how we really model the security that we want. Basically we're saying this is the security properties that we want and we guarantee it in a certain model there may still be attacks outside that model, in particular when it comes to implementation attacks. But it's improving upon the current state of the art, which relies on a lot of testing and code audits, a lot. And maybe you are ready today using this. So for example, just uh, three years back, um, some bits of high assurance crypto software was adopted in Firefox 57. So if you're a Firefox user like I am, you are actually every day using high assurance crypto software. Also, if you're using Google Chrome or if you're using Google products, you're probably also using it because some other piece of high assurance crypto software made it into Google's crypto library, the so-called boring SSL library. And if you're using Linux, like I do, then, well, you're also probably using it. Some bits of provably secure code computer verified provably secure code have been incorporated into the Linux kernel. Now, based on this, let me towards the end, give a bit of a, a more optimistic note here and say that by the end of 2021, um, in the ideal world, we'll have high assurance software of all this post quantum candidates. We have all security reductions computer verified. We have all software proven to be correct and we have all software at least proven to not leak through timing. To go further than that, we also have proper countermeasures against more advanced side channel attacks, and ideally also those countermeasures formally proven and computer verified. And then we have the whole world migrate to just a better generation of cryptography, including better implementations. Okay, this is overly optimistic. I don't think this is happening but let's see it as an ambitious goal that we can all work towards too. So with this, I would like to conclude my talk and give you a few pointers if you wanna know more about this. There's quite a few resources on post-quantum crypto and the NIST competition. Most importantly, of course, the NIST post-quantum crypto website and their corresponding mailing list. There is the Open Quantum Safe project, which evaluates various post-quantum schemes um, in the context of TLS, in the context of secure shell logins. Um, and then there's a website that I like very much if you want to get an overview of all the schemes and their properties. There is the PQC wiki by the University of um, in Florida. 
As a last thing, um, if you want to know more about high assurance crypto, uh, we're organizing roughly every year the high assurance crypto software workshop. And this workshop has a website with a list that is collecting all kinds of projects and success stories about high assurance crypto software. With this, thank you very much and thank you for your attention. All right, thank you, Professor Schreiber, for the explanation. Now we uh, move on to the question and answer session. We have already, I think, four questions, I think, and I will read the question for you. The first question is from Noel Estrella. Uh, the question is, what kinds of threats that exist for a cryptographic system? Maybe you can ask for that first, and then we can jump to the second question. What kind of threats exist for a cryptographic system? Mm -hmm. um, that's a very that's a very broad question. So it depends a bit on on how you define cryptographic system. Let's let's take one example. Let's take your web browser, um, the beginning example, web browser connecting to some secure website where you enter login data. So um, the threats there are that either the protocol you're using is not actually secure. So in the case of TLS, a lot of progress has been made towards really proving that the protocol TLS 1.3, the latest iteration, is really secure. Then there is the threat that the implementation is insecure, which is a much, much bigger threat because there's uh, considerably less work on, on proving that this is correct. And then there is the longer term threat that um, in the proof of the security of the system, you're making certain assumptions. So you're making assumptions that, um, for example, your bulk data encryption algorithm, AES, say, that that is secure. Or in this case, that um, the discrete logarithm problem is hard and that factoring big integers is hard. And if any of those assumptions breaks, then that would also be a major threat to that cryptographic system. And one of those threats would be exactly posed by uh, a quantum computer. Okay, good. Um, the second question, I will summarize the question, right? Um, so the, the, uh, the question, it's about the, the weakness in quantum cryptography. Uh, in ability to distinguish between noise and information interception. Is it true or, or do you have uh, explanation for this? Yeah, so you're asking the wrong person. Um, I'm, not working on, <laughs> on, yeah, I'm not working on quantum cryptography. So I, I'm assuming that you mean quantum key distribution. And um, well, quantum key distribution is sometimes marketed as another solution to uh, the threat of quantum computers. I don't really buy that argument. I also don't really buy um, the argument that it's protected by the laws of physics. So you can write up some ideal model in which this is indeed the case, but then when you're really implementing those systems, it turns out that while that model doesn't adequately capture all the aspects that we care about in the real world, so as far as I know, many of the systems that have been built for quantum key distribution um, and have been marketed as being provably secure, protected by the laws of physics, actually are not secure. So maybe this gives a little bit of an answer to the question, but if you want to know more about this, I suggest you talk to, well, either somebody working on quantum key distribution and quantum cryptography, or somebody um, working on while hacking those devices and, and breaking their security, which might be the more interesting discussion to have. Okay, so to make it clear, uh, so it's different between post-quantum uh, cryptography with uh, quantum cryptography. Is it different or is it Completely same? different, yeah. Ah, okay. You could say they have nothing to do with each other, yeah. Mm, so okay. the idea of post-quantum cryptography is that we can run all of those schemes on our normal laptops, on our normal smartphones, using the normal internet to communicate. We don't need to upgrade our hardware, but an attacker can't break it with a quantum computer. That's post-quantum cryptography. Okay, good. Thank you. Right, uh, for the next question, I think it's about, uh, okay. Uh, I want to ask you what 
do we need to create a secure REST a API? Yeah, that's the question. How to create uh, the secure REST API? REST API? Yeah. Because uh, uh, I want to make sure that my endpoint routes are actually secure because I have been working with Node for back and to create some REST REST APIs for quite a while. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, don't know how to answer the question. Uh, maybe send it to me by email that I'll look into this. But I think uh, I don't. I don't fully understand if I, if I understand mm. the question correctly. And if I do, I can't answer it. <clears throat> so. Yeah, yeah, it's no problem. Okay. For the next question. Uh, Okay, why open source projects are known to be safer than regular ones? Oh, this is actually a controversial discussion. Um, mm. So I'm, I'm a big fan of open source um, development. I would not make the general statement that, crypto, uh, that, that open source software in general is better than, than closed source software. The big mm. advantage is that with open source software, um, more people can take a look at it and that we can have an open public discussion about the security of those systems. And I think ultimately that leads to better systems. Um, but for example, I mean, I had this example on my slides that uh, Microsoft recently had to fix a serious crypto flaw. So yes, they do have problems, but in closed source software. But on the other hand, OpenSSL as an open source project also has problems, and GNU TLS as an open source problem uh, project has maybe even more problems. So it very much depends on the people that are involved and how much um, the community is actually working on, on improving it. Mm -hmm. I have seen for myself how open source works actually extremely nicely. So I put mm -hmm. some code online that um, had a bug, and that was a bug in 5,000 lines of assembly, which was basically not possible to find with testing. So it was triggered extremely rarely. And um, two people independently mailed me about this bug. So they must have actually read that code and tried mm. to understand it in assembly okay. level implementation. So not the easiest code to read. Mm. Um, so there, I must say it really worked. All right. OK. Um... The next question is, is proposed methods in crypto always evaluated by analyzing the math behind it? Based on your answer, what do you think to use black box methods such as deep learning to design a crypto algorithm? Mm. So the current state of the art, I think, is that you're building crypto um, by well, studying underlying hard mathematical problems and then reducing from those problems to the security of the system. Um, I'm not expert in deep learning, but I would be very surprised to see a cryptographic scheme developed purely by deep learning to be actually secure. I don't, my, my understanding is that deep learning is not quite there yet. And mm -hmm. I don't know if it ever will be, um, deep learning is, and, and more generally machine learning, is interesting in the context of crypto in, in other contexts. So, for example, when you're doing the side channel analysis, there's a lot of steps in there that are not hard in the cryptographic sense, but they take a lot of time if you need to do it manually. So, for example, when you're measuring power traces, then you need to align those traces. You need to make sure that they're all starting on exactly the same clock cycles, and then you can average over them and do stuff with them. And this aligning is something where, as far as I understand, machine learning techniques really help. And uh, even if there are some countermeasures making this a bit hard to by introducing random delays or something like this. So there, there are, on that front, um, there's quite a few interesting applications of, of deep learning, but I don't think um, that's the case for really constructing crypto schemes, at least not yet. I haven't seen anything that would be convincing. Okay, right. I uh, okay, I think that's all the question, but uh, before we end this, this session, I have one question. 
so uh, normally when we design an algorithm, uh, the the more secure the algorithm, the more complexity it needs. Is it true or? I wouldn't say so. I would actually almost say the opposite. I would say that mm. if you design something extremely complex, then mm. it's harder to analyze. It's more likely that um, there's mistakes in the analysis. So I would say that the best cryptographic designs are easy to understand mm. and, and easy to, to analyze, easy to implement. So I mean, we, we need basically, we need complexity, of course, for the attacker to break it. Um, mm -hmm. But that is, that is a different kind of complexity. I mean, this is basically uh, the complexity of solving this underlying hard mathematical problem. So I would okay. keep, keep schemes simple, I think is a good answer to this. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Schwab, for the uh, answer and for the nice presentation of this session. Uh, thank you very much. I think we will end this session and we will move on to the next session. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much for inviting me again. All right. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, Prof. Peter Suave uh, for the keynote speech and Mr. Kurniawan Tuirianto for moderating this session.